Welcome to First Christian Church, everybody. If you were with us last week, you saw that this was just all dirt. But now there is a nice concrete pad here. Uh, last week we talked about how Christ was our foundation. And we're told about a story. Uh, Jesus tells a parable about a builder, one who builds his house upon the sand and the other who builds his house upon a rock. And Christ is certainly that rock. It's that rock for us. Uh, and it's that rock for you too. We're excited about the opportunities um, that despite how tumultuous and tough this year is that Christ has provided for us uh, moving forward. Uh, and we wanted you to know that, that Christ is not failing us, just like a firm foundation will never fail us. We have placed our trust in Christ and he will not fail us. And so that's what I'd ask you to do today. So welcome to First Christian Church, everybody. May the peace of Christ be with you. Where's that amen, Leon? We've reached a time in our service where we share with one another our joys and concerns. Uh, of course, you know, the thing that's on uh, everybody's mind right now is the, uh, is the division in our country. I've, I've spoken about this before. Um, so please uh, purposely pray. Um, purposely pray uh, for the wounds and the divides in our country to be healed. Now, there's an old Jewish proverb that says what a bad prayer is, and it goes something like this. <clears throat> if you heard that a house was on fire and you prayed, Lord, please help it not be my house that's on fire, that's a bad prayer. Because if God were to answer that prayer and you already knew that there was a house on fire, you would essentially be asking God to move the fire, if it was, if it was your house on fire, to somebody else's house. That's a bad prayer. <laughs> Good prayers are prayers that ask, God, um, that ask God to help and support and uphold people no matter what they are going through. So, you know, I know we all have specific ideas and uh, about what's the best outcome and, you know, how things best would go. But a lot of times praying for that specifically is a bad prayer. Uh, really what we should be praying for um, is we know what the will of God is. We know that the will of God is to build the kingdom for people to be loved, for Christ's name to be proclaimed, um, and for righteousness to abound. And there's a lot of different ways that that can happen. 
And so when we pray for things like the division in our country, that's what we should be praying for instead of specific kind of, uh, specific kind of outcomes. Um, also, we uh, really want to pray for our communities uh, as, you know, the coronavirus continues to surge. We're on this new, this new path. Uh, it, it's really bad right here in Palestine right now. Uh, I don't know uh, where you are watching this from. Uh, and so we want to continue to pray for those. They're about to shut uh, some of the schools down again uh, here. And, and so we want to continue to pray for all those we know who are sick. And for all of those doctors and the nurses that are providing care in the hospitals, for the teachers and the students and those parents who are going to have to uh, find arrangements for their kids again. Uh, and so please continue to, to, to pray for our, um, for our communities. But this is also the season of Thanksgiving. Uh, and so here's what we want you to do. You can reach out to us at fccpalestine.org. And we would like you to... Uh, send us the things that you're thankful for. Uh, there's still a lot. I know it's been a kind of a crazy year. Uh, it's been a hard year for everybody. But there's a lot to be thankful for. And so we want to know some of the things that you're thankful for. We did this in our in-person service last week at church. And so we're asking you to do the same thing online. What are you thankful for? Let us know. So without further ado, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we pray for a divided nation. We pray that wounds would be healed. We pray that you would give us the ability to see one another as fully human beings. No matter what we believe or, or what side of the aisle that we happen to inhabit. God, we, we pray for love and righteousness to abound. In whatever form that might take. God, we also pray for our community, for those who are sick. We also pray uh, for this holiday time for those who are, have lost loved ones and who are mourning. We pray for the sick that they may be healed. And we pray for the divided that they may be united. God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, whose body was broken, split who bled and was broken and who raised was rose again on the third day by your mighty power. The one who can unite all divisions and raise the dead and heal the sick. In his name we pray. Amen. Leaning on the everlasting
Our scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner in a house by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants, a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading. Would you let us pray? God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O God, you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray my words would only be mine, O God, but yours. Amen. So when you're you're dealing with a a, a divided nation and a divided people, uh, particularly for we who are Christians, who are Christians, we proclaim in Christ Jesus in the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, we proclaim that there is no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. All are one in Christ Jesus. And we know that there are people all over the nation and all over the world who proclaim the name of Christ, who believe things completely differently than we do, even though... They still call upon the name of Christ and still name Christ as their savior. That means that in our country, there are Democrats and Republicans and independents and undecideds who proclaim the name of Jesus, although they go about it quite differently and their faith uh, propels them to vote in different ways, uh, compels them to take on different kinds of, of actions, whether they're social or personal or religious practices. They all proclaim the name of Jesus. Uh, and, and, and then there are those in our country who do not proclaim the name of Jesus, those around the world who, who do not proclaim the, the name of Jesus. Um, but I would propose to you that there, that God and that Jesus is bigger even than you think, bigger than even those who would uh, seek to proclaim Him, because He is in more places than you think. And if you want to help heal a divided country, if you want to participate in the ministry of reconciliation that Christ Jesus began with His crucifixion and with His resurrection. If you want to be a peacemaker and a reconciler, and if you're a Christian, I think you should want that. If you want to do that, then I think this story will help in the the way that it helps you see other people so you can reach out, communicate, and basically stand to be around somebody even if they think something differently than you. And let me tell you how. In case you haven't heard this story, it comes from Acts chapter 10. We are told that there is a man named Cornelius, okay? And we are told that he is a Roman centurion. A Roman centurion is uh, like a lieutenant. They are in charge of a hundred people, okay? That's centurion. A century is a hundred soldiers. And a centurion is a a guy that is in charge of a hundred soldiers. He is stationed in Caesarea, um, which is in Asia Minor, and he is, uh, and he is uh, one of these guys that's in charge of 100 guys, and he's from the Italian regiment, which tells you that um, he is in a Roman legion. Like, there were Roman soldiers who were not from Italy, but this guy's from Italy. 
Um, and he, but he is stationed abroad, basically. Um, and it says, get this, it says that Cornelius is a God-fearing man. And when it says God-fearing man, it means like our God, the, the God that the Bible's written about. He is a God-fearing man, even though he is a pagan, okay? He is a Gentile, right? And he is a God-fearing man. And then it tells you in the next verse why he's a God-fearing man, right? He is a God-fearing man because he prays regularly and he gives to the poor. Two things. That's it. This guy is a God-fearing man, even though he's a Gentile, because he prays regularly and he gives to the poor. That's it. Now, there, basically, the Jews, of course, if you're not familiar with this, you know, uh, if, you're, if you read the Bible, you should be familiar with this right now. But just in, in case you're not or you're not uh, a bu big Bible reader, Jews are God's chosen people. They're the people that God set aside, and they live pretty uh, restrictive lives in terms of the things that they allow themselves to do. Um, by, by, uh, by what they eat, the way they practice their religion, how they live their lives is somewhat restrictive because of their, their righteousness. They, they don't do certain things and they do certain things at other specific times um, as, a, as an expression of their faith. Um, and so in Judaism, they're quite serious about the ways that they show God that they are faithful people. Okay, And everybody else that's not a Jew, is a Gentile, right? Is a Gentile. But, and so they're, the Jews are supposed to be chosen people because they were set aside, and then they do these specific things, these practices and these laws, because they want to show their faith. And so they have a very specific way of showing their faith. And they're pretty proud of that. Especially in Peter's day, they're proud of that, what, what they do. But here we are told that this guy Cornelius fears the Lord. And the only things he does that we know about, that we're told about specifically in the Bible, is he prays regularly and he gives to the poor. Okay? And so if you were to ask even a Christian in Peter's day at this time, before the events of Acts chapter 10, he would tell you that only God's people can be saved. And he would say that Jesus is the Messiah, but Jesus came to the Jews, not the Gentiles. That's what he would say. Okay? That Jesus came to set things right within Judaism, and like God doesn't really care that much about other people. Right? That's what he would have probably thought. Even though he sat at Jesus' feet and listened to all his teachings, that's what he would have thought because that's what he was raised to think, and it's really hard to break out of those things that you were raised to think. But... Cornelius gets a message from an angel. An angel from our God, not some other pagan God. An angel from our God comes down and says, Hey, Cornelius, we have heard your offerings. We have viewed your offerings to the poor. And we think, as in God's chosen ones, think that you are great. And we need, to, we need you to go and talk to this guy named Simon Peter, who was one of Jesus' disciples. So go, he's in Joppa, go get him. Joppa, by the way, is where the reluctant prophets, um, where the reluctant prophets uh, uh, from, uh, the, who was going to go to Nineveh and Jonah in the well, Jonah, uh, wanted to run away to. So there's a little nod to Jonah here, a reluctant prophet, because the prophet didn't want to preach to pagan people in Nineveh, and so he ran away to Joppa. Um, and so Simon Peter's in Joppa, and Cornelius gets one of his soldiers and two of his servants, and they go to find Simon Peter in Joppa. In the meantime, as these guys are leaving to go to Joppa to talk to Simon Peter, Simon Peter's about to eat dinner, and he sits down in Joppa, and he's going to have his, his, uh, his very kosher meal, and he has this vision of a sheet and it's got all these animals on it clean and unclean and so the way the way that the that the kosher laws work 
uh, is that there are certain animals that you can eat if you're a Jewish person, and there are certain animals that you can't. So like one of the ones that everybody's familiar with, you know, is pork. If you're a Jewish person, or even an Islamic person for that matter, you don't eat pork. You just don't do it. You know, um, it's not a clean animal. You don't eat it. And so Peter sees this sheet coming down with all these pigs and goats and all this kind of stuff that you're not supposed to eat. Uh, bugs and, and shellfish. God forbid anybody eat lobster, you know. He sees like lobster come down and shrimp and all that stuff. And God says, go ahead, Peter, and eat it. That's what God says to him in the vision. And Peter says, I would never eat anything unclean. I'm a good Jew. And God says, do not, Peter, declare anything unclean that I have made clean. That I have made clean. And Peter says, very well, God, you're the one that knows. About that time, Peter eats, after that, Peter eats dinner, pondering his vision. There's a knock on the door. Who do you think it is? Oh my gosh, it's a Roman soldier when they open the door. Is he here to arrest me? And he's got two other guys with him? No, the Roman soldier tells him, are you Peter? And Peter says, yeah, I'm Peter. Oh, man, they're going to arrest me, I think. Hey, we need you to come to Caesarea. There's a centurion there who wants to speak to you. Why does he want to speak to me, Peter says. Well, an angel came to him and said that you needed to come and speak. You needed to come and speak to this guy named Cornelius. And so Peter says, okay, I, you know, I don't know if this is some weird ploy to arrest me or something, but he goes to Caesarea from Joppa with these guys. And when he gets to the house, when he gets to the house, um, Cornelius greets him and they start having a meal and Cornelius sits down with him. He goes, look, I don't know really what this is about, but, but an angel came to me and said, I needed to talk to you. And so Peter said, you know, that's funny. I just, you guys are Gentiles, and I would consider you unclean people, unrighteous people. But I just had a vision that God said, do not declare what I have made clean unclean. And so I don't know what this is all about, but let me tell you what I know. I know that that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all because our God is the God of all things, the creator of heaven and earth. And God in the form of Christ Jesus came down here to earth and he lived a righteous life and he was persecuted for living that righteous life. He was crucified and he died. And on the third day, he rose again so that all might have eternal life and all that call upon his name might be saved from what they once were. And as Peter is saying these words, we're told in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit comes down upon Cornelius and all the people who are gathered here, those people who sort of follow Cornelius. And they start to speak in tongues and do, you know, just demonstrate signs that the Spirit is with them. And so the Spirit is God's way of letting Peter and everybody in Acts know that like even they, no matter what they believe, that God is definitely with them, right? And it's undeniable when Peter sees the, the Spirit fall upon them. And Peter's vision comes true. Do not declare unclean what I have declared clean. And this is the first instance of the Apostle Peter accepting Gentiles to be Christians. Because before, a Gentile could not be one of God's chosen people. It just would not happen. Even if they were righteous, like Cornelius, even if they did all the right things, they could never be one of God's chosen people. But here, Peter's vision comes true, and God says, that person is one of mine. Now, I want you to think, about the implications of that, because that might sound, that story might not sound shocking or surprising to you at all. Because if you grew up Christian, or if you grew up in a society that is fairly equal in the way that it sees people, we're not equal in the way that we see people, but we are more equal certainly than what uh, th than what uh, Peter grew up in. 
This is not very shocking to you. I mean, heck, you live in a country that is founded on the Christian principle of equality. We don't practice it perfectly, but it's founded upon that. But in Peter's day and age, you were what you were born into, period, forever. No change in that. And these are people, Cornelius is the kind of people to whom Peter would think are detestable, awful degenerates. They thought that the Gentiles were just no good, good for nothing, awful degenerates. Those people. They were those people. And so Peter's kind of people would stand up there and turn their nose down, would turn their nose down at the Gentiles and be like, can you believe those Gentiles? They do this and they do that and they eat this and they eat that. Those are some truly awful, evil people. Good thing we're not like them. And the Gentiles, for the most part, would turn down their noses at the Jews and be like, what a bunch of backwards, dumb hillbillies that have to do all this weird laws and silly stuff. That's stupid. Can't believe they're so deluded in their thinking. We are free people, you know. But here in this story, God says, both Peter's kind of people and both Cornelius's kind of people can be acceptable to him. Think about that. So what's that mean in this day and age? In 2020? Think about it. Think about how many people that you think are just backwards and ignorant and dumb or want to destroy the country or like whatever. What if God is working through them in a way that you don't know? What if God, like Cornelius, has deemed them righteous and you just don't know them that well? Because you're grouping them together with everybody else. Or you're placing a stereotype upon them that was made up so someone could manipulate you into hating them. What if Jesus Christ really is the Lord of all? And the ways that we can worship and glorify that Christ are bigger than the ways that you and I glorify Christ. Maybe there's more ways than what you and I do. Maybe God is working through people that you don't even know in ways that you can't even conceive of. And sure, I mean, I know saying this kind of stuff will probably rub some people the wrong way. Oh, don't talk about those evil people in such positive light. You're just trying to whitewash over our differences or whatever. I'm sure that, uh, and many of them did, the Jews in Peter's age said the same thing about Cornelius. But there Peter was. Holy Spirit fell upon Cornelius and all his people. What if God is bigger than the names that we call ourselves? What if God is so much bigger than we can imagine? And what if we are small and unrighteous because we make such a big deal out of these differences? So when you come upon somebody that you don't agree with or you just even think that somebody fits into the stereotype of a kind of person that you don't agree with, why don't you prime yourself in your mind before you have a conversation with somebody or before you come into contact with somebody that the Holy Spirit may be working in that person in a way that you can't see or fathom. 
Because who knows what is in the heart or the mind of another human being? Could be evil, could be terrible stuff. But the God of all things may very well be living in their heart and working on them in ways that you cannot imagine. If you want to worship a big, powerful, strong God, then that God has to be bigger than the smallness of your mind. That God has to break the mold of every conception you have. And that means that that God has to be able to work in and through people who are not like you, who are nothing like you. If we all believe that, We'd be less divided, period. Period. If we all believe that, that Christ was big and Christ was working in lots of different ways through lots of different people, maybe it really would come true that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, because all are one in Christ Jesus. And then we would see the fruits of the ministry and reconcil of reconciliation, not just in our own hearts, but also in our country. I pray that the Spirit of Christ would mightily rise up within the hearts of those who call upon him and even the hearts who don't know they do but are walking in his way and that we would truly see each other as vessels fit for God. It is the good news of the gospel, it is the word of the Lord that Christ's ministry is the one of reconciliation and he offers the Holy Spirit to all people who will accept it. That is the good news of the gospel. It is the word of the Lord. Amen. Since Christ is the ministry of reconciliation, and he does live in the hearts of all who believe, we gather around a table every Sunday to remember that. So I'll give you a few minutes to grab your elements. I'll grab mine. Because it doesn't matter who you are or what church you may or may not be a member of or what kind of car you drive or who you voted for or how happy you are about the results of things or how angry you are about the results of things. None of that matters here because the truth of the matter is, is that I can't invite you to this table and neither can this church because Christ Jesus, our Lord, the one whose spirit fills you and me and even people I don't know or know anything about. That one has invited you to this table. So you may partake of these elements as you wish as we pray. Lord, we pray that this bread would be your body, broken for us, as broken and scattered as you are throughout many different kinds of people all over the world. And we pray that this blood spilled out would be the forgiveness of our sins, the deep wounds of division. And we pray that just as we take these elements into ourselves, that they would be the healing and reconciliation that you have promised that we need. And that they would give us the strength to be that which you have called us, your people. Amen. It was on the night in which our Lord was betrayed that he first took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. For as often as you eat my body and you drink my blood, you proclaim my death until I come again. The blood of Christ shed for your sins.
Thanks be to God. everybody thanks so much for joining us this morning for our morning worship service I hope that you've learned something maybe you didn't know before I also hope uh, that you realize that when I talked earlier about the firmness of the foundation that Christ provides for us that's where our sense of unity comes from not only as believers but all over the world and if we hold firm to that foundation it will not fail us it is the truth it says to cling ever close to Christ, even in difficult times. I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace and grace both now and in the life to come. See you next week, everybody.